Hello, hi everyone, welcome. Uh, so my name is Crystal, I'm with the Dog Psychology and Training Center. Today's Facebook Live is a request we got last week about fearful dogs, um, dogs that are scared of pretty much everything, um, and how to help them overcome that. And that's a really important topic because so many people wanna go fast. Um, we as humans are logical thinkers. We know that these irrational fears are no big deal. So if we could just get our dog to face them, they'll be okay. And that's not the case. Um, dogs don't understand our language. They don't have the same reassurances that we have in those expectations. And sometimes without properly building a foundation first, um, they can become more unstable by facing irrational fears. Even if those fears are not causing them harm, um, it's just that, that, that um, I don't want to say weak foundation, but it's an unstable foundation for sure. Um, and so I, the analogy I'm going to use is very similar to um, what I tell um, kids. I volunteer with SWITCH, which is a nonprofit that fights human trafficking here in the upstate. Um, and my favorite uh, role in switch to go to um, high schools and I get to talk to teenagers about abuse in the home, but also prevention and risk management to help them stay safe from online predators and traffickers. So um, we do a lot of empowerment stuff with them. And one of the exercises we do, it talks about how, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me and how that is the biggest lie of all time because words, unlike physical wounds, when you get a physical wound or a boo-boo, as my kids call them, um, you know, <laughs> sometimes just slapping a Band-Aid on it, instantly it feels better, right? Um, or if it is like a broken arm, there's a healing process that has to take place with that for your body to move on. And so whether it's physical therapy, whether it's just letting a cut heal on its own, um, it has to heal, right? Your body is making it heal on its own. Well, emotional wounds, right, that can be caused from irrational fears or words, they don't heal on their own. In fact, if we don't actively try to heal them, they just fester and become worse and cause a lot more problems for us in our everyday lives. So we have to be intentional in identifying these emotional wounds and then slowly um, building um, strength to them and inner strength to overcome them and make sure that they do not hold us back anymore. And so the same is true for these irrational fears with these dogs. By having them face their irrational fears before laying a really solid foundation, it's just making them more unstable because they have not gotten any reassurances and they haven't the confidence to face those fears yet. So um, we're going to talk about going really slow with these dogs. Um, you can definitely help a, a fearful dog overcome its fear. Um, so my own personal story with this is my own pit bull caster. Um, he passed away last Thanksgiving, well, just before Thanksgiving giving. Um, and he was uh, a ripe old age and um, he had a great life, a, a life with us that he probably wouldn't have had with anyone else because um, we were dog trainers and we knew how to help him. But I, I always just joke with my clients, God doesn't give me the easy easy dogs. He always gives me the, the challenging dogs because he knows we can handle them. Um, so when Castor came to us, he was a hot mess. Um, I, I called him my pit bull pansy. Um, he... <laughs> he's a big pit bull, like a beautiful broad chest. I mean, he's just a tank of a dog. Um, but if you had anything in your hand, be it a pen, a water bottle, a remote control, he would flip over on his back, shake really, really bad and pee all over himself. And my, my homeowner instinct is stop, you're peeing on my floor, right? But I couldn't do that to him because he was already in such a traumatic state of mind that any, um, you know, assertion or, or anger from me, even though it wasn't anger, it was just shock, please stop, right? It would just further him down that rabbit hole of fear. And so we would ignore him, which was very, very painful um, and really broke our hearts and like a number of times. There are times I'd have tears in my eyes, but we wanted to help him overcome this fear for several reasons. One, it's de it's detrimental to his life. If he would have lived in that kind of fear for his whole life, he wouldn't have lived to that ripe old age of 14 that he lived to. Um, if he... We, we were going to have kids. We didn't have kids then, but we knew we wanted to have kids. So again, um, kids are crazy, right? They can be a bit um, aggressive, pushy, 
manhandling, right, with dogs. And chances are, whether it's on purpose or accidentally, they're going to throw something at a dog, right? He's going to get hit by an object from a kid's hand. Um, you know, and we hope that it's unintentional, but kids can be stinkers sometimes, especially when they're babies, right? They're just bapping their toys, not trying to hit anything, but he could just be in the crossfire of that, right? Um, and so we really wanted to build up some solid foundation for him before we had our kids. Um, and so when we first got him, like I said, anything in your hand, he would, he would just violently pee and shake all over the place. Um, it was pathetic. It was so sad. Um, and so we made a we made a pact, me and Eric, that we wouldn't walk through our house without something in one or both of our hands. And we didn't look at Castor. We didn't talk to Castor. Um, we just ignored him through this. And of course, he would, um, you know, flip over and shake and pee and be all scared. And after we did it for a few days, he started to kind of, you know, he was still afraid, but he would either try to like hide his... <laughs> It's a big pit bull, right? Who tried to hide his nose under the couch. The couch was like this far from the ground. So literally only his nose, his whole snout could have been fit. Just his nose. He'd hide it under the couch. Like, they can't see me. Even though his whole butt is sticking out, right? Um, but he would just be sitting there shaking. Like, oh, they can't see me. They can't see me. Um, and again, no, nothing from us. We didn't praise him. Um, we didn't talk to him. We didn't look at him, just ignoring him. And by ignoring him, it sounds really cruel by human standards. Like if we saw a child acting like that and we just walked by and ignored it, like that would be awful. But for a dog, by acknowledging him in that state of mind, by saying, oh, Castor, it's okay. Also mentioning, we just got him, right? Like he's brand new to our family. We just adopted him um, from the shelter. So we didn't have a good relationship yet either. Um, and so by acknowledging him in that state of mind, we would tell him several things. One, he's on our radar. Two, we know where he is. We can get him whenever we want. He's already in this fear mindset, right? He already thinks we're out to get him, even though we're not. And so if I was to say, oh, it's okay, buddy. He's going to be like, oh, God, now they really know where I am, right? They could kill me any second. And it's just that's not what we were going for. So we ignored him. And by ignoring him, that made him realize, huh, they don't have to care where I am because they don't have any any intent to harm me. And so by ignoring him, that also started to build his confidence. So um, we kept walking with things in our hands. Um, also, I want to mention here too, we were doing um, obedience training with Castor. Um, if he had a leash on, he could sit, he could walk on a loose leash, he could place, he could do down, he could do all these things. But if um, there's something other than a leash in your hand, no go, right? He was very, very fearful. Um, and so and this is our own house. Like who walks to their house with nothing in their hand ever? Like we always have something in our hand. So we kept doing this process and um, it, it took us about a year from start to finish. Um, the finished result was that um, we have a friend, Logan, who's just a really tall guy, um, really intimidating. Um, he's a big teddy bear. He's the sweetest guy ever. But just that physical intimidation, right? He's just that that big kind of lumberjack looking dude. Um, and Castor was very, very afraid of him. Um we never said anything to him, never talked to him. He, he listened to us when we said, you know, just ignore him and that will help him in the most impactful way. Um, and so the end result of this training is Logan came over to visit and Castor, you know, was barking and trying to hide behind something. Um, and I said, Castor, it's okay, go say hi. And so he ran over to Logan and he stretched out his neck. Logan scratched his ear and then Castor took off to me like, look, did you see he touched me and I'm still alive. Um, and so there was that relationship that had been built over this course of a year between me and Castor so that we could tell him to go say hi and he was okay with that. Um, but so we, back to you know our process, we walked with things in each of our hands, ignoring him. Um, and... And then we got to the point where like we would have something in our hands and walk by and he would just like roll his eyes like these crazy people like are always having something in their hand. Um, and so that's kind of the point, though, right? Like we're crazy, but we're also going to have kids and they're psycho. So you really need to get used to us. Right. Um, so after he got confident with us having things in our hand and he just thought, oh, boring, um, then we would just kind of touch him by it. So if Castor was sitting here, here's his nose. Okay, Castor was sitting here, we would just walk by and we would just kind of touch him with a pen or the remote or a water bottle, very gently, but just touching him. And so he would flip back over, he'd pee on himself a little bit, he would shake. It wasn't nearly as bad as it was when we first brought him home, but it was still pretty sad. Um, and so there's just this, this fear mindset that just slowly desensitizing him um, to the point that we could get to the point where, you know, we graze him and he would just kind of roll his eyes again. And then we could get by or walk by, we can actually kind of bump him with something because again, like, I am a very clumsy person. I have thrown a pen across the room just by articulating with my hand and the pen went flying across the room. Like, I might accidentally throw something at him, not intentionally at him, but just because I'm a clumsy person that articulates a lot when I talk and I just 
drop things all the time, right? Um, and so we would get to that point where we could just kind of bump him with something and he would just be like, oh, these people are so crazy. Good, that's what I'm going for. Um, so you know, that whole process took us about a year. That was very early in our dog training career. So I've been training dogs for 11 years now. Um, yeah, 11, 11 and a half years now. I would do things a little differently now, obviously, um, with time and comes knowledge and wisdom, right? And so I've learned a lot of techniques and methods in the meantime or in the interim that um, I would have, now I would address that a little differently. Um, but the, the process is still very similar. Ignoring him, having um, those fears not be forced upon your dog to overcome them, but to be kind of in the distance and slowly working our way up. Um, Castor was kind of extreme because he lived in our house with us and we couldn't have anything in our hand. And that's just, I couldn't live like that. I couldn't prevent having something in my hand. Um, it's just, it is just impossible. Um, and so, so we had a, a comment last week. And so I'm going to go through the the fears. Um, the dog's name is Delilah. She's a golden retriever. Um, I think she's about a year or two old now. Um, she's not aggressive with her fear, but she's very, very fearful. Um, and so that's really important to me. If the dog was showing any time, any signs of reactivity or aggression, I would definitely encourage you to seek the help of a professional just because we want to make sure the dog doesn't hurt somebody in this fear state of mind. Um, fear aggression is really scary for us because it is unpredictable. Um, and so they will lash out whenever they feel threatened and cornered and have no other choice. We don't always know when that is. So um, having the help of a, of a professional, if your own dog has aggressive um, behavior, I mean, sorry, fearful behavior, but also has acted out aggressively or reactively in those situations. So um, definitely get the help of a professional. Um, if your dog is just fearful, but not aggressive, um, these are the steps that I want you to kind of go through. Um, she's terrified of other people in new places. She won't go up to guests when they come over. Um, she hides in her crate. She's skittish around parked cars, will turn and walk in the opposite direction if someone is coming in their direction on walks. So if, if they're walking this way and somebody's coming this way, she says, nope, I'm out, and she leaves. Um, and then bolts when she gets too scared. Um, so we have learned a lot about um, alternative medicine, not only with humans, but with dogs. And um, you know, I know chiropractic, um, adjustments can really help with a lot of anxieties and fear um, behaviors in dogs. So I would definitely encourage her to, to, to be seen by a canine chiropractor um, just to make sure everything is where it needs to be. That internal stress in the body can show in a lot of different behavior um, outbursts, whether it's fearful, whether it's aggressive, whether it's anxious, um, whether it's stressed, whatever it is, it can definitely have an external um, emotional response, um, all from just a misalignment in the spine. The, the blood's not getting to go um, where it needs to go to be a to be um, effective in the body. And so this internal stress can build up. Um, and so that's my first recommendation always is to have them be seen by a, a chiropractor um, just so that you can make sure she is 100% right now. Um, from there, this is when we're gonna start building up some of her behaviors. Um, there is, um, so I want you to advocate for her. When you have the guests and people that come over, I have notes over here, so if you see my eyes going to the side, um, I'm just checking on my notes because I don't want to miss anything. So when you have company come over and she goes to hide in her crate, um, or if people, you know, if you are out and about on a walk around the neighborhood and somebody tries to talk to her or talk to you, um, I would just advocate for Delilah and say, hey, just ignore Delilah right now. Um, she's really nervous and fearful of new people. And the best way to help her overcome that is just by ignoring her completely. That is you telling her that she is not on your radar. You are not out to get her um, and that you're cool. Um, and so, you know, having our friends do that to help us with Castor at the beginning of his training was tremendous um, because it took all that pressure off of Castor. Um, and he would still sometimes go to his crate. Um, especially at the beginning, but he would come out on his own. And so after our friends were there for a period of time, you see him kind of come back out to the living room and he just kind of, you know, sit back in the corner, kind of like a wallflower, um, just observing. And, you know, he probably wouldn't engage with our company until maybe the fourth or fifth time they came over. And then, then maybe he would come say hi, especially when the other dogs would go up to our company. He'd be like, yeah, me too. And then he'd, he'd, he'd fall back. And, and something to know about Castro was he was always an introvert, meaning he was not a dog that needed um, to be touched and fondled, especially by strangers. Um, he was just not a social butterfly. And that's okay. And acknowledging that and knowing that from him 
we never forced him to go say hi to people. If we would say, okay, you can go say hi, and he didn't, that's fine. I'm not offended by that. He has no pressure to follow through with that. It was just me saying, hey, this person's cool by me. So if you want to go say hi, you're perfectly safe to do to do so. Um, but he did not have to follow through with it. So, um, you know, it's kind of like when we um, go and visit family uh, when it's time to leave, um, we we have a lot of family back in Indiana that our kids don't see very often anymore. And so when we go to leave, I say, OK, um, you know, give hugs and kisses. But it's not implied. If my kids don't want to hug or kiss somebody, it might be a little offensive because we're family, but they just don't know you well enough yet. And I'm not going to put that kind of pressure on them. So, um, you know, it's just one of those things that it'll happen when it happens or it may never happen. It's OK. Um, and so letting your dog go at their pace, um, advocate for her. No looking at her. Tell your company, your friends, your guests or on the walk. If you know you have a neighbor that stops to talk to you um, and she's trying to bolt the other way. Um, you know, I would just say, oh, you know what? Delilah's really nervous right now. I'm going to try to get her home and just get out of that situation. When it's in your home and you have people come over, tell them not to talk to her, not to look at her and not to try to touch her. Because a lot of people feel like, well, if I can just get down and let her smell me and see and pet her and see that I'm a nice person, she won't try to be so scared. And that's the farthest thing from the truth. We have actually a family friend who um, their son um, or teenage son was at a friend's house and they had a, a nervous Nellie, a, a dog that was very, very nervous. Um, and so he thought, well, if I can just get down and pet the dog, he'll know I'm fine. Well, what happened was the dog actually nipped him in his face um, because those fear behaviors, right? That dog was already nervous. The, the teenage son got right down in, in the dog's level, right? He didn't mean to get in the dog's face. He just squatted down to pet the dog. But to the dog, that's that spatial pressure. You were all up in his junk for real. And the dog bit him to tell him to back up. Um, and so it was very unfortunate. Luckily, um, our friend's son was not hurt badly. He did get a cut on his nose, but that could have been a lot worse. Um, and so don't have them get close to your dog because it could be harmful to them, but it's really harmful to your dog's emotional state too. Um, and so um, let's see, what else do we got here? So I'm going to readjust my seat here. Okay. Um, skittish round parks car. So, um, this is something that, um, we have started to do. Um, Casey Cover is who I learned this from, um, with my perception modification certification. It's a big mouthful perception modification certification. Um, and that is to talk to her, talk to Delilah. If you see a car, if you have a car, um, that she's fine with your car, um, just go outside and say, Delilah, this is, a, this is our car. Do you see your car? Uh, you know, and she's fine to that walk away from it and then walk back up to it. Um, and then as you start to go for your walks and you see a parked car, and there's nobody in it because you don't want them to start their car as you're trying to help her overcome these fears, right? So much nobody's in it. Um, but just say, oh, Delilah, look, there's a car. We're going to walk by it. Okay, are you ready? Here we go. And just walk right by it. And she's going to be fearful at first. And then when she does it and she gets by it and she's walking now, um, then she's see, you did it. You walked by the car. What a good girl. Um, and so just by naming that object, naming that car and telling her it's coming, we're going to walk right by it. So you're not stopping at the car. You're not flooding her with the car and just, you know, tethering her to the car until she overcomes that fear. But just acknowledging this object is called a car. We're going to walk right by it. Here we go. We're walking by it. Oh, look, you did it. We walked by it. What a good girl. Um, and so just having that that conversation with your dog helps them um, anticipate um, when things like that might be coming. Um, and then the other thing that's really important. So these are all what we call preventative things or avoidance things right now um, because she's not ready to handle it yet. Um, eventually, the goal would be to help her completely get over these things, but not yet. OK, this takes time. It took us about a year with Castor. Um, and I, I just think that's really important for, for people to hear because fear takes time to build confidence. Confidence and a very, you know, cocky, pushy dog. Um, it's actually quite simple to kind of take some of that confidence away and say, hey, buddy, you know, you're not really you're not as smart as a human. So I need to take over the dog's like, OK, cool, as long as you make it fun for me. Right. Um, but with fear, it takes a lot longer to build that confidence because there's really a lack of trust. There's a lack of trust between you and the dog, between the dog and itself. Um, and they just don't know how they're going to survive another day. And so that fear. Right. It's. It's, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's irrational. I've said that like 15 times already. I don't know why I forgot it. It's irrational, right? It doesn't make any sense, but emotions don't always make sense, right? And fear is one of the most ridiculous, um, you know, thought processes that come with some of these irrational fears. Like, 
it's just a parked car. It's not going to jump on you. Right. Um, but anyway, so, um, so yeah, advocating for her, um, and then naming, naming some of the things that she's afraid of or skittish of. If there's certain sounds that, you know, like a school bus coming and when it does the brakes, it has that like sound, um, letting her know, okay, here's the school bus or the school bus. It's going to make that sound. Okay. You ready? Um, you know, and just letting her have a heads up. Um, at first you're going to think this isn't working that she's not understanding, but dogs have the IQ of a two-year-old. So if you think about holding a fearful two-year-old's hand and talking them through this saying, okay, here's a bus coming. You see the bus is coming. Okay. It's going to make that sound. Ready? Here it goes. Oh, look, it made the sound and you, you did it. You, you're still okay. You're still okay. You did good. Um, you know, so just that, that reinforcement, um, after the fact, um, and then, you know, if you are going for a walk and let's say you're on a sidewalk and there's somebody coming at you on that same sidewalk, step off of it. You can step in the middle of the street. You can walk to the other sidewalk. You can step in into someone's grass if you know they're not going to be upset about it. Um, but just get off of, of the sidewalk and yield to that person. So don't, don't force Delilah to, to face that fear head on because that's pretty scary. But advocate for her by stepping off maybe 10 feet away, letting that person walk by. And then resuming your walk and seeing, telling, you know, talking to Delilah and telling her, look, we did it. See, um, what a good girl. They, they're just walking by. Um, and then the bolting when she gets too scared. Um, so I think that's kind of goes with the, the turning and, and bolting on the walks if she sees somebody. But, um, you know, having her on a snug collar so she can't slip it over her head. Um, and then just giving her that that space that she needs. So, you know, I don't want to encourage her to bolt, um, but I don't want to um, stop her from bolting either. Not yet. Um, you know, if, she, if she's bolting, it's telling that's her saying, I need to get out of here. So give her some of that space and then she won't feel so tempted to bolt. And the goal is that over time you can start to yield closer and closer to the sidewalk. So eventually you can just step off to the side of the sidewalk or on the edge of the sidewalk and let those people walk by or just walk right by them. Um, and she's like, oh yeah, we just walk by people. Um, so I also, um, you know, I, I one question I didn't ask before this is um, was was Delilah always like this or is this something newer? Because when um, we worked with um, Titus, I I remember Delilah was just a puppy um, and she didn't um, not I wasn't aware of any fearful behavior. So I'm curious to know if this is just something that happened recently or if this has been kind of progressing over time, um, because if it is something that was more recent, then definitely, you know, a doctor's visit, a veterinarian's visit or the chiropractor can can help alleviate some of the internal things that might be going on that have caused some of these um, irrational fears. Um, OK, so how to how to help her overcome this. So um, advocate for her. Um, you know, yield to that space. Um, and then here's how we start to build some of this confidence. So we don't build confidence by making them face their fears at first. We think of other things to help them build confidence on. Um, so you talk about stage fright. If somebody's afraid to talk on stage, it's probably not the best idea to schedule them to speak in front of 200 people for their first time ever talking in front of people, right? Start small, talk in front of your best friend, um, in front of your family member, one at a time, and then maybe a small group of family members. So mom and dad and sister or brother, um, you know, having just that small family that you trust, they're going to support you. They're not going to throw tomatoes at you, um, but they're going to build that confidence and public speaking skills. Um, and then there are some, some groups that you can go to, um, the Toastmasters, um, they have, you know, little small groups that you can go out and, and talk in front of for very short periods of time, just a few minutes at a time. And that also builds confidence until you get to the point where you can get up on stage and do it. Right. So we, we start small and we work our way up. So do the same with these fear behaviors. So some of the exercises that we do to build dogs confidences when they come in is, like I mentioned before, talking to them, advocate to them, that's them building trust with us. I am gonna, I understand you're afraid of this and I'm gonna protect you from it versus, I don't know why you're afraid of this, get over it by putting them in front of that fearful um, object. And I know that's not anybody's intention, but in the dog's perception, that's what they, that's the difference they hear. Um, so when you make them face their fears before they're ready, they hear, 
I don't know why you're afraid. It's no big deal. Get over it. Um, and that's not the support they need. It's I understand you're afraid. I'm advocating for you. I'm going to fight with you to help you overcome this. And it's just that perception, right? It's all about perception, but dogs are sensitive to perception just like people are. Um, so activities that we do. Um, one of our favorites is the kiddie pool with empty water bottles. Um, and so start with just a kiddie pool and put some of her kibble around the pool. Um, so it's not in the pool yet, it's on the, the ground around the pool. Um, this can be done in the house or in the garage or outside, preferably not in grass, um, because you wanna make sure that she's getting all her food and I wanna see that she's eating her food for this exercise. I don't want you to have to go you know, feel through the grass and see if you find any kibble, but a flat surface, um, sprinkle that kibble around. Um, and so the, the goal is that at first you're gonna be sprinkling that kibble about a foot away from the kiddie pool and getting closer and closer until it's right around the edge of the kiddie pool meaning that when she goes to get a kibble, her head's going to touch the kiddie pool. Um, and it might even slide a little bit. And that's going to produce a fear response. She's going to jump back and say, whoa, what was that? And you're going to say, it's okay, come on, get this piece of kibble right here. Um, and, and just kind of encourage her to get right back to it. And the benefit of this is that the kiddie pool is not going to hurt her. It does make some sounds, but it's going to build that confidence, right? So this is kind of her beginning, her, her stage fright in, um, her stage fright journey of overcoming her stage fright by talking one-on-one -on -one to a peer or um, a friend or a family member. Um, so once she's really good with that, then I don't want you to put any water bottles in the kiddie pool yet. I want you to put her kibble in the kiddie pool close to the edge. So she doesn't have to step in it. She just has to put her head in and, and get that food out. Once she's doing that pretty confidently, you can start to spread the food out a little bit more. So now she actually does have to step in the kiddie pool and, and eventually the goal is to get her whole body in the kiddie pool rooting around for all that kibble until it's all gone. Once she's doing that pretty confidently, then you can start adding in a few water bottles. Um, what we do is we fill half of the kiddie pool up with water bottles and we put her kibble on the other side so that it's spread out on a flat surface, but also kind of pushed up against where the water bottles are. So she's going to be very tentative at first. Um, but again, we're doing this is this is how we feed the dogs their meal. Um, and so they, they're, they're hungry. They want to eat their food. Most dogs are very food motivated. Um, and so we, we encourage them to slowly face some of these irrational fears by eating their dinner out of something that would be normally spooky for them. And we're giving that that place as a positive association because oh, this is where I get fed. This is really fun. Um, so again, after she's pretty confident with that, then we fill it all the way up with water bottles. When I say all the way up, I'm talking about one and a half to two layers of water bottles. So you don't have to have it heaping with water bottles, but just a layer over the bottom and, and, um, and maybe one and a half to two layers so that you can kind of, um, sprinkle some kibble in there and it kind of goes in all which direction. And then she has to dig through it, right? She has to dive through the water bottles to get, um, her meals. And so this is a really silly exercise. Um, but it's really great for building a dog's confidence because it is, it sounds scary to them. The water bottles move unpredictable. They echo. It's really loud. Um, the, the pool is kind of a slippery surface. Um, and so it's a really great confidence builder. Um, that goes to my next, um, activity that we like to do, which is having them place or walk on different surfaces. Um, again, it sounds super benign and silly, um, but for dogs that are fearful, anything new can be can be fearful, um, can be scary. So we have them walk on hard floors, tile floors, shiny floors, concrete floors. Um, um, let's see. Um, oh, um, when I say walking on different surfaces, we have a a picnic table or like a six foot folding table that has like a hard plastic top. Um, sometimes we'll have them place on surfaces like that. We'll have them place on tree stumps, on benches, on diving boards, on um, um, pieces of wood. Um, if uh, you have like stacks of like ceramic tiles, um, you can have them place on that. Um, anything that's just new and different, have her place on. Don't force her, don't drag her up on it. Just a lot of gentle luring. If she's food motivated or toy motivated, you can use your toys to help her get to that, that spot. And then when she's up there, um, you know, she's, you can release her right away to get back off. So we don't make them stay up there. If they're nervous, we say place, and that means get up on this object. And then as soon as they get up, we say break. So if they want to get up and get right back down, that's fine. They have that flexibility um, to do as they choose. So there's no pressure um, to force them to stay yet. Um, the more we do this, the more reps we do, the less scary this object's going to be. And then we can start to ask some more time of them. Um, so it's not so pushy and it's not so scary, but we're slowly building them up for success so that they can um, reach the desired outcome, um, which is being confident about this weird surface. 
Um, my own Mastiff, Morgan, she um, is not very, she's not a fearful dog at all, right? Um, but all dogs have some things, some quirks that they're just like, oh, I didn't expect that. And hers was um, a shiny tile floor. So you know how like some tile floors have like a matte um, surface or look to them and then some have like a gloss look to them. If it was a gloss look, she was like, nope, uh, I'm 100 pounds and that looks dangerous. Um, even though it wasn't slippery, it just looked shiny. And so um, we had to help her overcome that and she doesn't have any fears. Um, but the more, the more exposure she got, to those shiny floors, the less resistance she had. So, you know, it gets to the point that now she's starting to kind of regress a little bit as she gets older, she really isn't as stable on her feet as she used to. So any shiny looking floor looks slippery to her. And she's like, I don't know if I can do that. My hips might give out. Um, so we're more sympathetic with that. That's not really fear. That's a logical response. But um, for Delilah, encouraging her to just get on different surfaces, whether it's just telling her to jump up, place, or walk over them, um, that's really gonna help build her fear. Um, some exercises you could do is take a ladder that you have at home and lay it flat on the ground and have her walk over it. So she's literally just putting her feet in the, the, the ladder rungs. So she's not stepping on the ladder, she's just stepping in between the rungs, um, but walking through it that way. Um, and then um, what I, I like to do is encourage families to do an agility course when you have a fearful dog. Um, so I think you guys did training at Astro for Delilah. Um, and I think they do agility. Um, so I would, I would encourage you to look into their beginner agility courses if they have them um, and see if they think that would be a good fit for her because agility is a really great way to build a dog's confidence with a fun environment. So it's not so fun at first for the dogs. Everything's new, right? And they're like, no, I, I don't know about this. This looks scary. Oh my goodness. Um, but the more they do it and they overcome those irrational fears, they're like, yeah, did you see that? I did the A-frame or um, I weaved through those poles and I thought they were going to chop me to pieces. Uh, but it just builds their, their confidence because they did it, right? The more wins your dog has, the more confident they're going to be for that new person that they're like, oh, I don't know who this person is. They could be like the mad hatchet person and try to kill me. The more confidence, the more wins your dog has, the less fear they're going to have for those moments. Not to say that they're going to be like, oh, you can pet me whenever you want. But she's going to be like, you know, I've overcome a lot in my life. I think I might be able to handle this, you know? And so it's just that slow confidence. Um, and so um, if you um, aren't interested in going to an agility class or Astro thinks she's too fearful for it um, because they sometimes do it in group environments and that might just be too much for her period, um, you can make it at your house, right? Um, so you can do like the ladder thing I told you. That's kind of like an agility thing. You can make um, a tunnel. So if you have some, um, you know, dining room chairs that she could um, crawl under, you can make a tunnel. Um, you can make a tunnel by taking um, the chairs and putting their backs um, so the straight backs of the chair so that the, the seats are pointed out this way, but the straight backs are like this and put a blanket over them. So then this is a tunnel. So then it's really big for her. She doesn't have to crawl through it. She just has to walk through it. Um, and it's and you can start with just two chairs. Um, so one, ch one chair here, one chair here, one chair here, one chair here. So two chairs on either side and a little tunnel. So she literally just has to step through it and she's out. Um, but that's a confidence thing. She does really good with that. Then add another chair and another chair. Um, and, so, and then you can start to space those chairs apart. So you can maybe have an eight foot tunnel that she has to go through um, that the kids would love help you know making this fort uh, fort tunnel for her but it's a great confidence builder um, for the weave poles if you, I don't know if you know what weave poles are in agility they're just um, poles that stick straight up and the dog literally just kind of walks through them like this um, so they're just weaving through it um, you can get what are they like driveway poles or something that you can put on the end of your driveway so that people don't drive off your driveway into your your flower beds or whatever? Um, you can get those little stakes. They have like a little reflector light on them or something. Um, you can stake those into the ground and encourage her to to go in and out of those. So at first your weaves are going to be very broad. She's going to go all the way through it, and then you're going to say, okay, let's go through this one. She's going to get through it, and she's going to. Um, but the goal is that eventually she can have her body touching these weave poles, and she's just going like this right through it. Um, so that's another confidence building activity. Um, the um, I don't I'm I'm not an agility person, so I don't know all the names of these things. But there's like a platform. Um, we always called it a place when I would help dogs that were fearful. Um, we would get to 
borrow another trainer's agility course for a private lesson. Um, I would take the dogs there and we just slowly go through these things at our pace. So there was no pressure, no competition. It was just for fun and, and building the dog's confidence, but we would just home place and they'd hop up on that platform. Um, again, that raised level um, is a confidence builder because they did it. They jumped to the top of the mountain and they survived. Um, they have the, um, the A-frame. So agility A-frames are pretty stout, um, but they just walk up the one side and then go down the other. Um, again, it's it seems a little nerve wracking at first, but then when they get down it, they're like, oh, that wasn't so bad. Um, maybe it was a little scary, but it wasn't as scary as I thought, right? And the more they do it, the more they overcome it. So create your own um, agility courses. I'm sure you can Google it, how to make your own agility course in your backyard or in your house. I'm sure there's tons of free resources, free resources for that. Um, and then another one that's really easy and fun is scent games. So um, if you're like us, <laughs> we get like a new Amazon delivery like every other day. Um, so we have a lot of boxes at our house. Take those boxes and then put them in a small cluster so that she can kind of walk around them, but they're not like spread all over your house, right? Um, so keep them in one room, but put um, maybe one or two kibble in only one box. So if you have four boxes, only one box is gonna have kibble in it. The other three are just empty boxes. And tell her to go find the kibble or the treat or whatever you wanna use and say, go get your treat. Um, and so don't rush her through this. This is the hardest part. Don't talk to her, don't touch her, don't guide her, don't point. Just let her go. She doesn't need a leash on for this. You're just going to stand back. So don't be close to the boxes, but stand back um, at the edge of the room. So you feel like against a wall or sitting down and just let her find it. And it might take five or 10 minutes the first time, or it might take five seconds, depending on her, her food drive. But um, this is a really fun exercise. Once you start, once she starts to get faster and faster at finding those, those kibble, um, those treats, then you can start to kind of spread the, the boxes out more in the room. So you may be putting them against, you know, um, the edges of the room or maybe um, behind some furniture in the room and, and telling her to go find the kibble that way. Once she's doing really good with that, then you can start hiding um, you know, boxes in different rooms and telling her to go find it that way. Um, when you start to spread it out more, you can kind of guide her a little bit if she's coming up like, you know, I, I have no idea where to look next. Say, well, come on, let's go look over here. Come on, come on. And encourage her to go into the next room and say, okay, go find the kibble in here. Um, and just kind of giving her that, that head start to build her confidence too. But that's a really great exercise because one, it lets her go at her, her own pace. Two, it's making her work. Fearful dogs tend to not think for themselves. They tend to not work for themselves. They tend to just stand back and cower. By, by doing a scent game, it's encouraging her to come out of her shell um, and really take those steps. I think it's Sue Conklin. Um, I can't think of the name of her, her business, um, but she does a lot of scent um, trials and competitions with her own dog. She has some beagles. Um, and so she might be a great resource to contact if, if um, scent, scent games is Delilah's thing, because that would be a really great way to build her confidence, um, because it is a, a, a game that is independent. So, you know, Delilah's working basically on her own, and then she's, she's winning, and she knows she did it herself, right? It's one thing to win with a team. And you're like, yeah, but we all kind of contribute contributed. But it, when you win by yourself, you're like, that That was all me. I, I did that all by myself. Did you see it? Right. And so it has a different perception in the dog's mind. So um, scent games are another really, really fun way to help build up the confidence. So these, these games, these activities that we do, we spend weeks and months doing these before we start to have the dogs face their fears. And when we do ask them to start facing their fears, we do that from a distance. So if people, if people, if dogs are afraid of people, we may go to Conesty uh, like early in the morning when hardly anybody's there and stand at the baseball diamonds. So like we might see a person once or twice in you know, a 20 or 30 minute time, but we make sure we're far enough away that that dog sees that person in a distance so that they can be successful. If they're not successful and they start to um, bark or pull away, then we did not set the situation up good enough. We need to be farther away. Um, and so once we start to get to that point where we can find, okay, this is the level, this is kind of the, the breaking point, if you will, if we get any closer, my dog's going to try to bolt or bark. That's where we hang out for a while until the dog's like, well, this is boring. Those people always just walk by. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It is boring. So let's get maybe two feet or three feet closer. Um, and I've literally taken lawn chairs um, and a book. 
or a blanket and a book. And I just sit there and read with the dog's leash in my hand and I'm just waiting for people to go by and the dog just gradually gets over it. Um, we don't have a whole lot of uh, pedestrians in our neighborhood. So we can't really do this exercise exercise outside of our own house. Um, and then in some neighborhoods, you can't really do this exercise in your neighborhood because either it's too busy or you're too close to the sidewalk. Um, so you wanna make sure you have enough distance um, between you and whatever Delilah is reacting to so that she can be successful and not bolt. Um, and so that's it, um, go slowly, um, You know, don't go too fast. This is kind of the, the hare and the, the tortoise, right? Slow and steady wins the race. Go very, very slow, one step at a time, and then keep us updated. So as you're progressing through this, if there is something that she's really good at, let us know. If there was something that didn't work well for her, or she was really afraid of it and you're like, I thought this was supposed to help, let us know because maybe that's just not her thing and we can help with some other ideas that I probably didn't think of of mentioning today that we also do. Um, but it's a prog it's a progression and we're all individuals, dogs included. So what works for one dog building confidence may not be the best solution for another. You know, agility and scent games are kind of two different things, right? Agility is a very physical activity, so it kind of helps dogs burn through some of that stress and fear physically by just moving, walking it out. But also those dogs might be more physical, able dogs. Like they just like to get out there and move. I am not a physically able person. I don't like to just get out there and move. I'm a very sedentary person. Um, and so scent games might be a, a better game for those dogs that aren't very physically motivated, that just want to go at their own leisurely pace. And, um, you know, it's a lot less pressure. I don't like competitions. I don't like winning and losing. Um, you know, I just... I just want everybody to be winners and everybody to be friends. Um, so gym class was not my thing, right? Um, but for some, for some dogs, that is that's that that golden ticket. And then other dogs, we have to find other options. So um, let us know how this goes. Um, if you have a, a frightened dog um, that I did not address something in this video that you thought would be helpful to your dog, you have a question about it, please post it in the comments. I can recap to this next week um, or do a whole new video um, just for your dog. But um, yeah, give me some feedback. Let me know how this is. I've went on for a really long time. I've been trying to keep these videos short and sweet, but there's a lot of goodies in here that I want to um, give out for Delilah to help her overcome some of these fears. So let me know if you guys have any questions and I will see you guys next Thursday. Bye.